Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Of course, we continue our walk through the Gospel of, the, of Matthew, all about the King and His Kingdom. And we've made it to the important, most important section, I think, of the entire Gospel, maybe even of the entire Bible, and that is the crucifixion of Jesus. I think it's safe to say that the crucifixion of Jesus is the pivot point of history. When you look at, at history, it seems like everything focuses either leading up to that point or going back to that point. And so I view the crucifixion of Jesus as the pivot point of history. The title of my message this morning is Going to the Cross. Jesus has been through several trials before two different high priests, the full Sanhedrin, before Pilate, before Herod. He's been condemned to death by the Jews, and he's been condemned to death by the Romans. He was beaten when he was arrested. Remember, Matthew says they laid hands on him. That's code for they beat him. Trust me, I know this. I've used that code. He was beaten along the way. He was beaten by the Romans. He was beaten by the Jews. And then Matthew spends 30 verses to tell us about the cross. My plan is to go over these 30 verses over two weeks, this week and next. There's just too much detail for us to spend it all or go through it all in one week. So let's begin working Jesus through the cross. We begin here in chapter 27, verse 27, with Jesus being mocked. The Sanhedrin had placed themselves in a bind through their illegal trial of Jesus and conviction of Jesus in the middle of the night. Not just the middle of the night, but the middle of the night during the feast. They weren't to be doing those things then. Then add to that that the Sanhedrin wanted to make a show of Jesus. They wanted to make a show of the execution of Jesus, so they turned Jesus over to Pilate so he could be executed by the Roman cross. And all of the drama that would go into that, that we saw at the beginning of the service. And I reiterate, if that doesn't choke you up, you have no emotions. You're a psychopath if that doesn't choke you up. So the Jews convicted Jesus in the middle of the night, and then they met early in the morning after sunrise and, and did a perfunctory conviction again, and then turned him over to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate found no guilt in Jesus. And Pontius Pilate's wife claimed that Jesus was a righteous man. But in order to keep the peace, Pilate agreed to execute Jesus. Remember, as the Roman governor, he had the authority to do things that he ordinarily wouldn't do in order to keep the peace. In order to keep the peace, he agreed to execute an innocent man. So we pick up the account in Matthew chapter 27. Verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered a whole battalion before him. Matthew gives us a lot of detail here that if you don't think about it and if you're not familiar with the historical context, you'll just gloss over and it won't, it won't round the picture out for you. Matthew breaks from the other synoptic Gospels and to identifies the soldiers as Romans. Luke and Mark don't tell us they're Romans. They just tell us they're soldiers. They may very well have been uh, Jewish soldiers. 
But Matthew tells us that they were Roman soldiers. Now, why is that important? That's important because the battalions that were assigned to Israel were some of the meanest and most barbaric men around. They didn't consider the Jews to be worthy of good treatment. So you wonder why the, the, the zealots had a policy of carrying a knife in their coat, in the, in the hem of their coat, so they could just, in, in a crowd, like we saw in the video, just pull that knife out, stab a Roman soldier, put it back in their coat, and move on, and nobody would know. Kind of jungle warfare, guerrilla warfare. Why? Because they were, they were being oppressed by a, a military that did not treat them nicely. It was nothing for a Roman battalion to march into a village, kick all the doors in, and drag everybody out and turn their, their homes upside down looking for maybe nothing, just having fun. And so, when you think about who was present that Matthew tells us about, he tells us that the soldiers were Roman soldiers. Everybody reading this in the first century would have known that meant these were barbaric men. These were men that would treat Jesus very poorly. Roman soldiers assigned to Israel had tremendous ability to torture and to be abusive. Matthew tells us that the soldiers took Jesus into the governor's headquarters. Headquarters is the Greek word praetorium. The problem is we're not sure what this is a reference to. Many scholars believe that the trial um, before Pilate actually took place in Herod's Jerusalem palace. I find no reason to, to think that that's accurate. Pilate had a palace in Jerusalem, plus he had the Antonia Fortress. Um, Praetorian is used to speak of several different locations within Israel, but most notably, it's used to speak of the Antonia Fortress. The Antonia Fortress looked roughly like this. This is from the, the uh, Holy Land model, the Jerusalem model at the, at the hotel in, in Jerusalem. The Antonia Fortress was a large complex just outside of the temple complex. It was, it was an interesting place where Pilate had official offices, where Herod had official offices, where there was a jail and a dungeon for both the temple police and the Romans, Roman guard in uh, Jerusalem. What I find fascinating about the Antonia Fortress it was also the place that the high priest's robe was stored. When the high priest wasn't wearing it, he took it off and he deposited it in the Antonia Fortress so it would be protected. Remember, the robe had all the jewels and stuff on it. It was bedazzled. I think that's the term that craft people use today for putting jewels on stuff. So the, the high priest's robe was bedazzled, but stored in the Antonia Fortress, a Gentile complex because it was that secure. I think that's where they took Jesus. It's an interesting place. Gentile involvement in the Antonia Fortress, but also the place where the high priest's robe was stored. The Sanhedrin wouldn't even go into the place of Pilate's trial, because they didn't want to get defiled during the feast. And yet, this was the place that the robe of the high priest was stored. In other words, yeah, I'll keep some laws, but not others. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? The archaeologists, or many archaeologists, believe that Pilate tried Jesus in the courtyard of the Antonia Fortress. Look what the Gospel of John tells us. So when Pilate, this is John chapter 19, verse 13, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down at the judgment, the Bema seat, at a place called the Stone Pavement. And in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Not Golgotha, Gabbatha. It's believed that the Stone Pavement is the courtyard to the Antonia Fortress. That makes perfect sense to me. 
Because Matthew tells us that Jesus was taken from the trial location into the governor's headquarters. From the, the Gabbatha pavement into the fortress. So back to Matthew chapter 27, verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him. Battalion is the Greek word sparian, which can be translated as band, cohort, tactical unit, or division. Cohort is the most often translation for the word. And a Roman cohort is 600 soldiers. So Matthew is telling us that these barbaric men numbered 600 when they took Jesus inside the Antonia Fortress. If anyone thinks that Jesus was not further abused after he'd been convicted before he got to the cross, you just don't know what 600 Roman soldiers in Israel could do. Matthew tells us a little bit about what happened. And they stripped him, and they put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. So here's our, I'm glad we're back together because I can now ask you questions again. Question, what does the robe represent? They put a robe on him. What were they doing when they did that? Say that again. Mocking him? Okay. We well, said he was. Okay, good. Royal royal robes? Yeah. And this one was scarlet, or maybe it wasn't. We'll get to that. Any other, any other comments? In verse 28, Matthew differs somewhat from Mark's account. Matthew says the soldiers put a, a scarlet robe on him, while Mark says a purple robe. I suggest that the color description is not as much about the color as it is about what is represented by the robe. Scarlet robe would be a robe that represents the authority of the person wearing the color. The ranking Roman soldiers moving about the fortress would be in scarlet. They would have their, their, their breastplate on, and underneath that there would be scarlet. I think Matthew is reflecting that Jesus was given a robe that was seen to mock him for being the leader of a revolution against Israel. I'm sorry, against Rome. He was mocked as being the Messiah. What did that mean? Not Savior in the, in the spiritual sense like we think, but the ones that would kick Rome out of Israel. The high-ranking Roman soldiers would wear scarlet, so they put a scarlet robe on him and mocked him. You think you're going to be the guy that kicks us out of here? We're going to kick your butt till next week. That's what they were doing. They were mocking him. Mark says the robe was purple, which represents royalty. The same robe, just used to represent different things from different perspectives. You claim to be king of the Jews? Well, watch this. So is it possible that the robe was both scarlet and purple? Yeah, we, we, you know, we have pretty pretty sophisticated dyeing techniques. Not so much in Israel at the time. So could it have been a combination of those? Yeah. Could it have been a faded robe, a faded purple that looked scarlet or however those colors work together? Sure. They, they, we're not talking about different things here. We're talking about the same thing, just different perspectives. And in our house, when we, when we look at fabric, because that happens a lot in our house, when you look at fabric, I see one color, Linda and Kate see another color, and Harper sees, I think, something completely different. Yeah. 
So it makes perfect sense, right? That we could be talking about the same thing. Mark and, and uh, Matthew are not of the skull. The guys doing this were masters at that kind of torture. They had perfected it. That's why they were there. Because they were good at that kind of stuff. Since Jesus was accused of being king of the Jews, it was fitting for him to have a crown. The soldiers mocked Jesus by kneeling before him and calling him king of the Jews. He took a reed and gave it to him to be a royal scepter, and then they took it away from him and used it to beat him. Remember the uproar that the world was in when a young kid was caned? That's what we're talking about here. They didn't just tap him with it. They, they didn't knight him with it. They beat him with it. They abused him and mocked him without mercy. Roman soldiers were well known for treating people this way. Especially people sentenced to death. You know, we have a, we have a process now in our country and in most countries that even if you're condemned to death, you're not going to get tortured. You're not going to get abused. You have dignity. You have rights. That did not exist then. And if you were condemned to die, the soldiers had free reign to do whatever they wanted to you. And I think they did. There was no cruel and unusual punishment charge in those days. Death was coming, and along the way, the abuse was real. Matthew chapter 27, verse 31. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put on his own clothes and led, a, led him away to crucify him. We don't have a sense from the text or from the other Gospels, really, how long this went on. It had to be a relatively short period of time because by 9 o'clock he's on the cross. So unless everything previous to this was pushed earlier a day, this is Friday morning, and it's early after sunrise, and so we, we have a compressed time of, <coughs> of three hours or so. But you can do a lot of damage to a person in that short time. There's plenty of time for them to go through all this abuse and then to march Jesus to Golgotha and nail him to a cross so that it's standing at 9 a.m. At some point, they'd, they'd had enough, and they put his clothes back on him. Remember, Jesus had been beaten several times already, and he'd been scourged. His back was raw, bloody. Jesus was in bad shape. The soldiers led Jesus away to be crucified. We venerate the route out of Jerusalem from the Antonia Fortress to Golgotha. We call it the Via Della Rosa. Dolorosa, which by the way means way of grief. I've walked part of the Via Dolorosa. It is, a, it is an amazing place of history with little um, chapels and signs along the way. Is it the way Jesus was walked? I don't know. We don't really know for sure. Could be, might be, might not be. We don't really know. From the north of the Temple Mount, winding through the streets of Old Jerusalem, out through the western gate is the route that's venerated as the way Jesus was taken to the place of execution. And today, little chapels and markers fill the, the streets. But we have no way to know. I can just tell you that walking it was emotional. We get to the actual crucifixion. We're going to work through some of the cross this morning, and then, Lord willing, next week we'll work through Jesus dying on the cross. And as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry the cross. Now you know why I played that video this morning. Watch the Lamb. The guy carrying the cross for Jesus was Simon the Cyrene. As they went out means they walked along the route from the Antonio Fortress to the place of execution, identified as Golgotha. 
through the busy streets of Jerusalem. Remember what was going on. This was the feast season. Jerusalem had swelled two, three, four, five, ten times population. It was packed. Those narrow streets, people walking, coming and going. And a Roman procession came along. They showed it a little in the video. Pushing their way so that they could walk with their prisoner. Matthew doesn't give us much detail about the trip. Luke tells us that there were a lot of people along the way. A large group of people, I suspect disciples of all kinds, followed the, the official Roman perp walk. That's what, what, what it was. A perp walk of Jesus, walking from where he was tried and convicted to where he would be executed. Luke also tells us at one point Jesus stopped. And he spoke to the group of women that were following. Jesus told them not to weep for him. Luke also tells us that the two criminals crucified with Jesus were also in the procession. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us that they tell us about Simon of Cyrene being compelled to carry the cross. This is why we played Ray Bolts' song in the call to worship, watch the Lamb. A great story of Simon of Cyrene. Here's another couple of questions for you. Why do these three synoptic Gospels tell us about Simon? What are we to learn from the guy compelled to carry Jesus' cross? I love it. I see little tufts of smoke coming out your ears and you're trying to think about that. What, what am I to learn from this? He did it well. Did he? Yeah. He was voluntold. Why do the three synoptics tell us about this? There are a lot of things we don't have in all three synoptic Gospels. So why this little... It's a a factoid that we skip over most of the time. Go ahead. Hmm. Yeah, probably. I don't know that that's accurate because I, I think I think Rufus might be a Roman soldier. Yeah, but uh, hard to say. You know me; I like to ask lots of questions. Okay, an everyday person. Okay, that could be. Certainly, it illustrates for us how badly Jesus had been abused. Certainly it did. <clears throat> as, I'm, as I'm reading these things, and I see what sometimes seems like non-important facts, I wonder why they're there, because God doesn't waste any time in His text. So I ask myself, self, why are we told that the Romans compelled Simon to carry the cross? First, I think it reflects, as Linda said, how badly beaten Jesus was before the trip down the Via Dolorosa. Notice that we're not told that somebody else was compelled to carry the cross for the other guys. I don't think they were beaten near as bad as Jesus. Now, it could be that they were, and we're just not told, but it seems like nobody's carrying the cross for them. Jesus is is spent. He's very beaten. Second, I think this factoid aids us in recognizing that Jesus' humanity limited him. We often think of God being able to do everything and anything. But Jesus had set aside some of his attributes. And he was very human while remaining God. And his humanity was almost completely destroyed in going to the cross. 
Because the Pilate would later ask the question, he's dead so soon? Well, he's dead so soon because he was almost dead when they nailed him to the cross. We need to think of those important little factoids that were given in the text. I think the event with Simon the Cyrene helps us in remembering Jesus' torture. His humanity. What he went through. Verse 33. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. We don't know why this location was called Golgotha, which is a Hebrew Aramaic word used for the location. Matthew, Mark, and John use Golgotha, while Dr. Luke uses a version of Calvary. Jerome, about 300 years or so after the time of Jesus, said that it was called Golgotha, the place of the skull, because it was the customary site for the Roman executions that occurred, and the skulls of those executed were piled up around the site. Now, I, I want you to think about the, the cruel and unusual punishment that that would be for a condemned man to carry his cross to a place where he knew his skull would remain. That's a pretty barbaric looking thing, right? There's, no, however, there's however no evidence that Jerome is actually giving us a historical fact. We have no evidence for that. Others argue that Golgotha was called Golgotha because a skull was often used to symbolize execution, particularly by the Romans. So the place of the skull would be understood as a place of execution. Oregon, less than 200 years later than the cross, said that it was the place where Adam's skull was buried. Yeah, we got nothing on that. That's just like, that's one of those esoteric comments that you make somewhere that have no basis in fact. I thought it was fascinating. Why you would think that, I don't know, but my personal favorite is what is known as Gordon's Golgotha and the Garden Tomb. In 1833, General Charles Gordon, who was part of the Jerusalem peacekeeping force from the British government, was out for a stroll, and he looked up and he saw this. The, the buildings and stuff weren't there, but what looks like to be, now it's, it's, since Gordon saw it, it has eroded away extremely uh, bad. But you can see what appears to be two eyes and a nose and maybe a mouth below. Looks like a skull. It is outside the western wall, the, outside the western gate of Jerusalem, of the old city of Jerusalem. And just down the mountainside and around the corner over here, is the garden tomb. Did you make it to the garden tomb, Anne? Ooh, nice. The garden tomb has been determined to be an authentic first century Jewish tomb. Carved into the limestone or into the into the rock, the granite, I suppose, and has a has a burial bench. It has places for ossuaries and has a trough for a large stone to be rolled back and forth. I've been to that. I've been inside that tomb. Is it the tomb of Jesus? I don't know. I'd like to think it is, but a lot of people a lot more smarter than me can have determined that maybe it's not. But I can tell you this. It was the most spiritually emotional place in the earth that I've ever been to. Sitting there on a bench, looking at the tomb, looking up at Golgotha, imagining that at the top of the hill, the Romans drugged Jesus and nailed him to a cross. Say that again? Yeah, yeah. You can't quite see him in this picture, but one of the pictures I have... There's all sorts of buses parked right down here, but and there's a there's a large 
um, common road that goes by Golgotha. We know that there was a large road that went by at the time of Jesus' execution. So is this the place? I don't know. Sure looks like it to me, but that doesn't mean anything. I didn't even stay at a Holiday Inn last night, so I can't make any claims on it. Matthew doesn't give us a lot more details, but they offered him, a, offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. It was customary to offer the condemned man some wine before he'd be nailed to the cross. Now, even in the video that we watched earlier, showed Jesus carrying a, dragging a full cross. Typically, the vertical portion would remain in the ground and the, the prisoner would carry just a large crossbeam. And then they would have pulleys at the top where they could affix ropes to the crossbeam after the person had been affixed to it and, and drag it up. That's typical way that would happen. But they would nail him, nail the prisoner to the, to the beam, and before they would do that, they would offer him a great big old chalice of wine or a skin of wine. Pretty high alcohol content, kind of way to deaden the pain. But because these Roman soldiers were so barbaric, they took some gall and mixed it into the wine. Gall is a very bitter, bitter, bitter herb. It is such that it just shuts you down right away. And he tasted that and he said, no, I'm not going to do that. So without anything to deaden the pain, that had to be immense at this point, they drove the nails into his hands. And then they pulled the beam up. And set it in its position. And then nailed his feet to the vertical beam. No pain relief coming for Jesus. He was nailed to the whole cross. But what he carried through the streets was just the vertical beam. Because it was so heavy. Right. In, in whatever fashion, he's carrying it. Yeah. It would be very difficult to erect the cross with the vertical piece attached. Sure. But we also see in most of the pictures that Jesus was a, was a weak, effeminate, Weakling, and he wasn't. So pictures are not authoritative. Then why have them? That's a great question. They're definitely not inspired, yes. None of the Gospels give us any detail of how Jesus was nailed to the cross. Most historians believe that Jesus was nailed just to the cross beam. It was erected onto the, onto the uh, vertical piece, and then his feet were nailed. When the crossbeam was attached, his feet would have been nailed um, down below. Luke and John tell us that Jesus was crucified in the middle of two criminals. Matthew and Mark and John tell us that after Jesus was nailed to the cross, the soldiers shot dice for his clothes. Now I want you to think about what his clothes were like. He was arrested Thursday evening and beaten, so he was already bloody, probably sweaty and stinky. And then he was beaten a bunch more, and his clothes was taken on and put on, put on and taken off multiple times. I would guess ripped, but yet they still shot dice to see who would get his clothes. By the way, that's the fulfillment of Psalm chapter 22, verse 18. Jesus is still alive on the cross in certain agony. And his life is slowly, slowly, slowly slipping away. Dr. Luke tells us that the other, that as the soldiers were shooting dice over his clothes, Jesus says, 
Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. Even in the middle of this execution, Jesus was asking for those who drove the nails into his hands and feet, and whom he watched barbarically gambling over his clothes. He wanted them forgiven. That to me is beyond gracious. I believe it reflects his true divine nature and his capacity to forgive. Then the soldiers sat down to wait for the condemned to die. They they were well experienced at this. This often took days. It often took days for the condemned to die on the cross. And so they had a camp there. And they sat down and took it easy. Made some grub. Gambled. They waited on the cross for Jesus to die. And over his head they had put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. John tells us that the sign came from Herod. Since the crosses were in full view of the city's road in in and out on the western gate, (coughs) many Jews coming and going, they could see the crosses and read the sign. John gives us an extra detail that the sign was written in Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. The language of the day of the Jews, the language of trade of the region, and the language of the Roman soldiers. Everyone could read this sign. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. The point is, Rome was saying, look, we we killed the guy that was leading the revolution. There is no revolution. We still win. That's what Rome was saying. That's what Herod was saying. John also tells us that the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leadership, when Herod produced the sign, they said, no, 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 don't say that. Say, this man said he was. Yeah, I've written what I've written, Pilate told him. Too late. I've written what I've written. So, I've given you a couple of hints on this already. So, Why was the contents of the sign important to the Jewish leadership? That was certainly true for the Roman leadership. But why did the Jewish leaders rebel at the sign being, this is Jesus, King of the Jews? They wanted it. He said he was King of the Jews. What difference does it make? Yeah. They wanted it to reflect that he couldn't possibly be the king. That's why he's dead. I think the Jews wanted to the sign to reflect what Jesus said rather than a factual statement because they wanted to maintain the illusion that Jesus had blasphemed. Jesus had blasphemed, said he was God, said he was the Messiah. They wanted to ensure that everyone saw Jesus as a fraud. They needed to keep their position going. Verse 38, the two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. As I looked at this verse, I was at first a little puzzled by the simplicity of it. Other than simple historical facts, why are we told this? What, what, what's the big deal? So he's crucified with a couple of other criminals. As I sat there and just imagined the scene in my mind, I saw it. There on the cross in the middle was the creator, sustainer of the universe. The one who made all of the universe, who made history possible in the middle of society's outcasts. All condemned to die. The juxtaposition of those men on the cross, the perfect creator, sustainer, and those who stole from society. 
the very best and the very worst. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He's king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. As people passed by on the main road in and out of the city on the west, they came by the execution site to see what was going on. And as they went by, they mocked Jesus. We can tell that the, the plan of the Sanhedrin was in well shape here. They mocked Jesus saying, you said you could rebuild the temple in three days, but you can't even get off the cross. <coughs> Not much of a Messiah, are you? How do you think you could be king of Israel? Which means getting rid of Rome, but you can't keep Rome from nailing you to this cross. Matthew records for us a string of insults hurled at Jesus from the people coming by and observing what was going on. Matthew also tells us the Jewish leadership was there. And they were also insulting Jesus. I get the sense that they were the instigators. They caused this mob the way it was forming. Yes, ma'am. They did not think he was the Messiah. They, they couldn't think he was the Messiah because that was completely inconsistent with the false doctrine that they had presented. Well, that certainly could be part of the truth, that they wouldn't let themselves believe. But remember, we're also told that their hearts were, were hardened. <coughs> because it wasn't time for Jesus to be the Messiah as we as they thought of the Messiah. He needed to be the spiritual Messiah first. And that's what this whole this whole thing is about. There will be a day when he comes as victor and will destroy the enemy. They 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 couldn't believe that. Um we go on to verse 44. And the robbers who were crucified with him, also reviled him in the same way. Yeah, they had a lot of nerve, right? As Jesus was in the middle of, of his agonizing time on the cross, and remember, it's not just the physical abuse, however horrific that was. Matthew doesn't talk about it, but Luke does. The agonizing feeling of being Rejected by his father. He also had to deal with the insults from two men that were convicted of crimes right next to him. He had to deal with their insults. They were accused rightfully. He was accused falsely. He had to bear their insults. Luke tells us that one of the men crucified with Jesus repented of his insults, but Matthew here makes it very clear that at the beginning, he reviled Jesus as well. At some point, he would turn to Jesus and say, remember me when you're in your kingdom. Now think about this. Here's Jesus being insulted by everybody and everybody around, including the convicted criminals next to him going through the same thing. As the creator, sustainer of the universe, he could have stopped it at any second. He could have ended the physical torture 
and the spiritual agony. But he chose to stay the course and complete the mission. Remember the night before, he prayed and sweat drops of blood, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not your will, but mine. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Sorry, I got that backwards. He did what the Father had called him to do. He provided the Father a legal way to forgive us. Next week, Lord willing, we'll continue to walk through the crucifixion as Jesus dies. But until we get through that text, I would like you to think about the significance of the abuse Jesus went through. From the arrest until nailed to the cross, and then on the cross. Here's my last question of the day. Why did Jesus have to go through the torture and abuse? We always talk about Jesus dying on the cross. Matthew has just spent a long time telling us about the abuse Jesus went through. Why? Okay, so that we we understand he has empathy with us because he has experience with us. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed by our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that uh, brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Some translations, instead of wounds, have stripes. Where do the stripes come from? If we're only talking about being nailed to the cross. From the beatings. From from the flogging, yes. Right. Isaiah says that by his stripes we are healed. Not by his death, but by this abuse. I think Jesus was abused to give us comfort. as we are abused for following Jesus. His disciples were all abused for following Him and dynamically preaching about Him. They could go against the crowd because they knew the power of Jesus and the healing only He can provide. The abuse of Jesus gives us confidence that He understands our situation like Steve was talking about. We're strengthened by His power and His understanding of our situation. He has felt the pain of torture and rejection. He has felt the pain of the sword and the government. He has felt the pain of abusive comments, even from people who actually were guilty. Jesus was tortured so that we could be healed and encouraged by God's power. So we're saved by Jesus' death. We are healed through His abuse. The author of the book of Hebrews says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but in whom every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. The author of the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way that we will be. I submit that the abuse he was given is part of that temptation. I just want you to think about If you were nailed to the cross, you'd gone through all that abuse, and you had the power to stop it, would you? I certainly would. I don't like pain. I would have jumped off of that cross, and I'd have sent down thousands of angels and wiped them all out. Exactly. Exactly. If it was easy... It wouldn't have been worth anything. He was tempted to do that. I have to think that he, in his humanity, he knew what he could do. When the author of the book of Hebrews says, <coughs> for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, he knows what it's like. And yet he went through it. Jesus is not just our Savior. 
He's also an example of how we're to live and to die. We're to serve Him with our entire being, even if that means dying for Him. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Not his nail wounds necessarily. All the wounds that he experienced. I think that passage in Isaiah is so telling. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the dedication of Jesus to go through the process, through the pain, through the agony, through the torture, for those many hours as he was arrested and beaten, and tried and beaten, crucified and beaten. He went through all that so that we could be healed by his wounds. He died so that you would have a legal way to forgive us. Thank you, Father, for that. Thank you for all that you do for us. We love you, and we want to be obedient to you, and we want to be faithful to you, even in difficult times. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.